every single person is different. And the biggest part of the job is really figuring them out and learning how to talk to them in the best way possible. And I've messed up before. Business of Architecture, episode 382. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am talking to Los Angeles-based interior designer, Ryan Sagian, who is emerging as one of the most formidable talents providing inspiration to many young people that they too can follow their dreams. Ryan is only 28 and even before hitting his 30th birthday he's overcome many challenges to find international claim, become a social media darling and is now building his own product empire. Ryan has been brought up in LA and founded his interior design firm at the young age of 21. He's since become a go-to designer for discerning clientele and A-list celebrities alike who revere his raw yet refined sensibilities. Ryan's firm has completed some extraordinary projects including luxury homes in Beverly Hills, Bel Air, New York City and a 40 million private residence at the Four Seasons Resort Los Cabos at Costa Palmas in Mexico. So in this interview we talk a lot about how Ryan has grown the practice, how he's use social media to leverage and win work, how he interviews his clients and has them enrolled into his design vision and methods of working. So this is a really insightful interview. Uh, So sit back, relax and enjoy Ryan Sagian. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Ryan, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well. Great. Good. Well, welcome. Welcome to the show. Fantastic to have you on. Um, You have quite an incredible career. A young interior designer based in LA. You've grown your practice or your firm quite rapidly. You're a mogul on Instagram and have mastered social media marketing um, and you've got quite an array of discerning clientele and you know you're working with lots of high net worth individuals and celebrities um, and you're kind of well known for your Hollywood flair if you like. So I, I suppose the first question is how did your business begin? I'd say that my own business started when I was 21 but the actual involvement in the industry started when I was 15. Right. I was interning for a firm, Woodson and Rummerfield's House of Design, and I'm still really good friends with them. Um, but I just had this very big entrepreneurial mindset and it was very hard for me to work for somebody. Um, funny because the industry, what I do is working for people every single day, but in an industry that is so creative like this and so much of your decision-making would have to be then filtered by your superior. It was too complicated. I I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how I did it for as long as I did, but I needed to get out. I was itching to do it on my own. And my parents had a garage that they had kind of converted into like a back house. Um, But it was legitimately a garage. You still had to open the garage door to get in. And my dad built a small little kitchenette with no appliances, just like uppers and lowers, a cork back splash and turned it into a little studio for me. And I was 21. I was still working for the firm, um, doing a few projects for free on the side. And then when I felt like I was confident enough to do it on my own, I just bounced. I was like, I love you guys, but it's time for me to do my own thing. And that's how it started out of the garage. That's, that, it's, it's, it's quite young to set up a business in the design industry in many ways. What, how it, did you? It was so intimidating. So intimidating. 
and, and particularly in the kind of um, circles that you operate in, it's a very well-established market, if you like. There are many seasoned players, many. How did you manage to get your foot in the door, if you like, or get those first few clients? You know, if I didn't have the community that I have here in LA, I wouldn't have, um, I don't think succeeded because it's very rare that there's a young, hot, cool designer in the interior design world. It's, that's a little bit more what fashion covers. Right. And it first was intimidating to get clients. So I was really lucky that I had my mom's friend or my cousin's friend or the Persian community or even just the, the, the Jewish community here in Beverly Hills and in LA. It's just so saturated and it's so congested. Um, they gave me the initial jobs that I needed to build the portfolio of work that I have now to be able to get the jobs that I want in a more diverse community of people. Um, but to tell you, it wasn't at first the clients that were extremely intimidating. If you just walked into the design center and you went into a showroom like, and you were trying to source samples, no one wanted to help me. It was like, who is this kid? They either asked me, who do you work for? Or they wanted so much evidence that I actually had my own business, a website, a business card, um, a resale number. It, I couldn't catch a break. No one took me seriously. And you know, honestly, to this day, now, obviously, they do because my age should not be what is working against me. It should be what's working for me because I am that millennial. I am that next generation. I know technology and how it can help get the job done more efficiently and a lot and communicate your design a lot better to your clients digitally. And especially now with this whole COVID, like mm. everything virtually, it was an easy thing for me to kind of dive into because of the way that I was trained. How do you, how do you deal with your age? If you like, do your clients still are concerned? Do they ever bring that up and think, Oh, you're, you know, you're too young or do they ask about experience? How do you navigate? They have a lot of knowledge of whatever respected fields they're in and a lot of money and a lot of confidence. I educate them. And that's where my education really comes to play. I talk about the scale of why this won't work with that. I talk about the historic periods of where they were actually from and how, although we like to mix things, sometimes a very heavy juxtaposition can become a complete clash. I educate them on that stuff. And that's when I gain their respect even more because they know that I know exactly what I'm talking about. And I do like my favorite class was furniture history, it was architecture history. Mm. Um, if they wanna tear down a wall or they wanna restructure a room, but I know that that design or that casing or those moldings or th that archway is so true to the architecture of the house and changing it would be like murdering it. I communicate that to them and they understand. They're, every single person is different. And the biggest part of the job is really figuring them out and learning how to talk to them in the mm. best way possible. And I've messed up before. I was, I was gonna ask you, yeah, how, how do you know how to talk to certain personalities? Is there like a psychological, profiling tool that you use or oh, you can tell like you would like, you can tell like I'll throw things out like in the initial meeting if if I, let's say we're going over like images of inspiration I'll say this is so effing hot and I can quickly see if they pull pull back or get a little tight okay this mm. person doesn't like cursing and this person doesn't like talk which i don't understand why you would hire me then because if you know me and i'm very 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 vulnerable and blunt on social media yeah and that is like my primary way of I, I, getting clients so usually it's very rare actually it's never happened where somebody um, interviews me and has not heard of me or been following me or is familiar in any way shape or form with me and my work um so if you're hiring me and you you're surprised i talk like this it's kind of weird but there have been times where I've been hired. Usually it's by the wife and the husband doesn't really know me. So then right. I have to really study him. And you you just feel it out. Maybe I think I have a high emotional IQ. I wish I had a high IQ and some other things, but I have a high emotional IQ, which is really advantageous in an industry like this where 
being really personable, personal and one-on-one -on -one is, um, it, it's a big part of your stock and trade, but. How, how did you learn these? Was it, how did you learn these skills of um, emotional awareness or emotional intelligence? Was it something you've always had or you've kind of nurtured it or, or was there a period of life where. Oh, it's my gift. Like we all have a gift. I have, I have that gift. <laughs> Um, no, I think just being ultra sensitive. I'm really, really, really sensitive. Mm. Um, I used to think it was my biggest weakness. I hated it, especially in high school and especially as a closeted gay kid throughout all of my adolescent years. But um, I ended up realizing through a lot more perspective and time that it was one of my greatest assets and my greatest strengths. My ability to sense on such a deep level, I can, I'm not a psychic and I never want to be. I just could feel the way somebody feels in that moment kind of like empathically mm. and I think that's just my intuitive nature just my sensitivity has have you ever got it wrong with what the client? have you ever got it wrong with a client yeah oh yeah oh yeah and how do, how do you recover from but it only happened once right it only happened once and it was when I was really excited I was a little bit more on the immature side look again yet you don't want to admit it because you want to say respect me for my age. There was a time where my age did work against me because I was still a young kid and I would sometimes treat clients who were much older and I had to be much more professional as if they were my peers and they were not. So I have said and done things before that were a little de detrimental to my career, but I'm also a really quick learner and I just never did that again. How do you, continue to maintain the relationships with your with, with your clients and how do you and how do you keep expanding your kind of circle of influence if you like so one thing i do is i'm not professional fully i think that there's a level of professionalism um that you have to have and i have mm -hmm. but i i like to become friends with my clients and yes if you're a one man show and you're billing also, and you're invoicing also, and you're kind of doing everything, which I did at the beginning yeah, and which everybody will do when they first start out, it can get a little uncomfortable to become friends with your clients and then talk about money, financial confrontation to this day makes me uncomfortable, but it's a lot easier now whenever it comes from another person's email in my office and I'm never discussing money with them. And it really is just the fun stuff. Like, let's put this here, let's design it like this, let's design it like that. I can um, become friends with them. And we'll, they'll invite me to dinner, we'll go to birthday parties at their house, they'll come to my house. And that friendship, in a way, overpowers. I think that friendship lets the project go a little bit more smoothly. But then it also opens me up to an entirely new world. Let's, if I am friends with them, and I do go to their birthday party, um, I meet all of their friends. Um, they talk about me to all of their business associates and their colleagues, and it just expands and it expands and it expands. And actually, I never thought of it, but you just bringing it up to me, I think that's a big reason why my network grew so much and I got so many more clients. It's because of that relationship I built with them and the friendships that I built that then brought me more and more. Mm. You, you were saying how in the early days that financial confrontation and still now is something that you, you know, you dis, you dislike. How do you, how do you deal with it now differently to how you did it in the past? I still do not like financial confrontation. I, it, it's, it's a very, and they don't like it. Mm. They get, um, they, they don't like it either. I've always, when it, when it comes to financial confrontation, I've always learned to drop my ego completely because I have one. Um, I think every designer has one. I think every human has one, but sometimes us in, this, in our field can have it bigger than others. Yep. But when I, you need to drop it for business. If I could give one recommendation to anybody, somebody, there has to be someone designated to billing at least three to four days a week in your office because you can't handle all of it yourself at all. And you, and it, it gets a little bit odd to be having that conversation with your client all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you grew from being a solo show to the team that you have now. It started with interns because I liked free labor. Yeah. 
And I had them all the time rotating. And then I had one assistant who was really bad. She was horrible. And I let her go. Then I brought on another intern. I actually had an intern while I had her. Then I let her go. Then that intern became my assistant. And it was just me and him. I'm going to remember. It was like really just me and him in the office. And then after that, I brought on another intern. I was always an intern. And if I liked them, I hired them. It was the best way. Because you have them for like a, what is that phrase? Pro, Pro probationary period. Yes. And you, if they're good, you keep them. And as, as and is there a lot of people willing to to do that? And that's kind of is that an industry standard? And in- I've never had a, an issue with um, interns um, not getting paid because I always give college credit. I always bought them lunch. If they had crazy errands to run, I paid their gas. Yeah. Um, I worked for free for three years, but you have to put in your time and your effort. Why this is an industry where unless you've graduated and you have a nice portfolio, you can show me the only way to know if you're good enough is if you actually work here. So I think unlike a lot of other industries, it's one of those where an actual um, probationary period and internship where you can actually show what you can add to the team is really important. Well, this is interesting because often in in the architecture industry, we have a lot of conversations about unpaid internships and, you know, in in some cultures like in Japan, for example, there's a lot of culture of doing that in different entrepreneurial circles you know, we're often, we often hear, well, if you want to get your, your foot in the door, then you got to do something, right? And, you know, when you're young and you're, and you're hungry and you're, you know, you can go and you can do stuff for, you know, you can live on, li- you can live on very little, put it that way. Yeah. What are some of the benefits to having unpaid interns, like for the intern, for the business? For the business, it's the free labor. For the intern, it's, I don't care how much schooling you have it's so different in the field yeah i that that is where i learned the most i don't you know we're in the creative industry you can you you can never teach somebody talent talent is intuitive it's what you're born with and it's it's taste you can't teach somebody that you can teach someone the tools they need to then take that in a quality and that intuitive talent that they have and help them execute it mm. in whatever respected industries they want to execute it in. So I don't think you go to fashion school or interior design school or architecture school and they teach you how to design beautiful spaces. I think they teach you the tools you need. So you can go to school and learn AutoCAD and learn furniture history and learn color theory and all of these things that will help you in your respected field, but you'll never learn how to go about a project with a client or execute and arrange and schedule an actual installation to actually resource products, materials and shop, and then deal with all of the stuff that goes wrong. Because I don't think that I've ever had a project where nothing went wrong Mm. that you learn in the field. So I think in, in any way, it's actually way more advantageous for the intern than it is for the employer. Um, there's always people that will do the type of labor that I poured coffee. I organized the library. I remember actually cleaning. I fluffed the pillows because I worked for a firm that was on the second floor of their showroom on the La Cienega design quarter. So downstairs was the showroom and I was always rearranging the showroom. So. I did whatever I could do to help them and make their job easier. And that's all that you can do. I, I think this is, a, this is a really interesting conversation about, yeah, the, the, cause we often hear so much criticism about unpaid internships um, and, you know, the, the impact it has on the industries, but actually, you know, so many careers are crafted and connections are crafted um, in that kind of period. And it's, and also there's a, there is, there is the question of like being resilient, like, and resourceful. And it's not, it isn't easy. It isn't an easy situation, but an internship with the right place and with some of the right connections can save you three, like three months interning can save you three or four years working. Oh yeah. Oh, and that's yeah. the way, that's the way to look at it as a kind of investment. I know people in, you know, in architecture or, 
or um, in the music industry to, you know, who went and worked for certain producers who like knocked on their doors and said, I want to work with you for you. I don't care. I'll work for free and went off and, you know, did kind of crazy hours after they'd finished their uni studies and they'd be working until three in the morning, come back. But you see the people who are willing to do things for free and who are willing to do this and put in the work, those are people who are doing this for the love of the industry, for the real true passion. They're dying to get in. They're so thirsty. And that's how I was. I was so thirsty and I wanted to be in this industry so badly. It's not an industry to get into if you just want money. It's not an industry to get into if you are tired with your career and now you're like, I'm so bored with economics. Now I just want to get into design. I want to be in the creative field. I'd rather make money doing that. And the first thing they want is an, a good paycheck, even for an internship. You're doing it for the wrong reason. And the, the interior, the designs won't even come out nice. Because I truly believe that as creative people, we're divine people, like we're really divinative people. And like we're put on this earth to do like what the creator does. He creates. So if you are a creator as well, you're literally doing like God's work. I don't, that's really how, what, how I think of it. So like, going back to what I was saying, you can't teach someone talent. It's innate. It's intuitive. If you're designing from the heart intuitively, you're co-creating in that moment with the universe, with God. That will be beautiful. That comes from love. That's going to be pure, incredible design with a lot of self-expression. If you're designing for, for money, for the paycheck, it's going to look so bad and it's going to look like a corporate building. It's going to look like a mall. It's not going to look good. Those are the people who usually work in healthcare design um, or commercial design and are sitting in cubicles and all they work with is Corian and vinyl and laminate and things like that. I'm talking about the real creative. Where did you find that? How did you do that? Mm. incredible spaces and those designers those big 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 names they were thirsty you can go and read all of their stories and all the things that they did whether it was waitressing so that they could make money to start their own company or whether it was interning for free that and, and look for that whenever you're looking for your interns the people who look like they have ambition in their eyes and they're excited and they're dying to get in versus those who are like well, how much are you going to pay me if I come here? I mm. hate. How so, so? How do you now balance kind of getting paid and and creating beauty? I know that. Um, and do, do, you, do you ever find yourself like you know get tempted to do a job just for the money? And yeah, it's happened. But as someone who is so in touch with what I'm saying, mm. I saw it happening as it happened. I knew I shouldn't have taken it, but I took it. As we were working, I knew it was going downhill. And when it finally went downhill, I was like, I should have listened to myself. I should not have taken it. We all do. Like, look, we, the only way to live today is with money. So at the end of the day, we're going to sometimes make that mistake. Um, and I think I'll probably make that mistake a few more times. I, mm. Who knows? But my point is, it will never be smooth because it's not soul work. It's, it, it's beyond that. It's all ego. How, how do you, um, nowadays, how do you negotiate those fees with clients? How do you know, how do you, cause that's something, another thing that many creative people struggle with is knowing what their worth is and being able to, you know, ask for the right amount of fees. I say this, I always say that I know there's somebody out there way cheaper right? and that I have their number and I can refer them and that they're really talented and they're lovely but they just don't do what I do. And they'll always say, well, what is it that you do? I'm like, there's a reason why you're calling me. There's a reason why you follow me. There's a reason why you like my work. You can hire those people and they'll be way cheaper, but it just will never be the same. How do people end up following you? Cause you've got, you've got an extraordinary Instagram following, which is an, an a notoriously difficult platform, particularly these days to grow on. Um, you've got, what is it? 185,000, 184,000. Yeah. But I'm like stuck there. It doesn't move anymore. I'm dying to get to the 200. When I first got on Instagram, it was because I thought it was a photo editing app and right. I didn't actually use it for, um, 
for what it is today. I really just liked, there was a filter I'll never forget. It had like a um, play button logo at the bottom and it kind of gave this really nice uh, warm, what is the, they don't even make that filter anymore. It used to be also on photo booth or at Sienna. Oh like, yeah, 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 I remember, I remember. They don't have it anymore. And I used to always go edit the photo, save, upload to Facebook. And then everybody started talking about, are, are you on Insta, are you on Insta? And I'm like, I have it, but what do you mean on it? And when I opened it up and I actually went into the profile, I'm really not that good with technology to this day even. Um, I noticed I had like 300 followers and all those photos that I was editing were on there. And some of those photos I was just editing for fun. They were horrible photos, like really, really bad pictures. So I saw that like, oh, all my friends are following me. So I started using it, but I was in college my freshman year. So I was posting kind of like an, I used it as an Insta blog and I was always posting a floor plan I'm working on, um, fabrics I was finding, furniture I was finding. And people were in, infatuated by what I was studying mm -hmm. because in my community or even within my city, you usually saw people going into medicine or real estate or law. It was rare. There were some who went to USC architecture. Actually, a lot of friends ended up doing that. Um, but it was a master's program, so they went later. So at that time, no one was actually studying interior design or posting things like that. It was really interesting. And people would start following me and said, I, it's so cool, you're studying, this is so cool, this is so cool, this is so cool. So I got excited, I kept doing it. And I started posting at the firm I was working at. I started posting when I would go shopping with them. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And over the course of time, it just became the main way I did anything. I sold stuff, I got clients, I posted my work. And even whenever I got a little bit more popular and editorial opportunities came my way, sometimes I would decide against the editorial feature because they have this editorial calendar and you cannot post any of your work until it is finally featured. And I post it and everyone sees it and it gets mm. pinned on interest and people start sharing it and I get another job. So it, I think it's changed not only the way that we showcase our work, but the way that we get clients and the way that we get published. Do you, do you have nowadays then a kind of a content strategy that you employ for your social media or is it still very much kind of what you like and what you're interested in? How do you how do you curate what goes on yeah. there? It has to stay to what I like and what I'm interested in. There have been times where when I'm too busy, it's like my brain automatically thinks that the only way it's going to be relaxed is if I have a routine. Mm. It's it, and I just I just watch it happen. It 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 can't handle all the information, so it wants to schedule it and give me a routine. And it puts that in the same, it's like your Instagram post. And it makes me feel like I have to now have this plan, this content arranged, and I have to post it at this time. And I'll fall into that. And I snap out of it within a few months because, and I realize it's not performing as well. It's not getting as much love. It feels a little bit more computer and, and planned out and not as true. And I had go back to just posting random sporadic stuff. And then that's when you'll notice more videos of Shanaz, like who's in the front, who's one of my um, colleagues, or that's when you'll see silly memes and funny quotes and things like that, because I'm coming out again. But whenever okay. I'm too busy, which, so, which is all the time, but whenever I'm letting it get to me, I become a lot more structured and like this. And then it comes out in my social media and it comes out in my work as well. So relax, just freaking relax. You have to relax. How, how are you on any other platforms that you're using a lot at the moment? Is you know, there, club view is a new club clubhouse is a new thing that they're making me do. Yep. Everyone's like, you need to get on clubhouse. You need to get on clubhouse. Um, I don't mind it. I started a house um, with a friend of mine, Elizabeth, and she's in New York. It's called the house house. 
And actually yesterday Clubhouse was saying that it's the second fastest growing interior design club on Clubhouse, which is awesome. And um, we do a weekly talk. It's easy, but I really can't handle any more of these these apps and like it's too much. It's it's a lot. It's mm. a lot. It's a lot. How, how do you how do you kind of maintain balance and harmony in your life? I don't. Like, in a very bad place. I'm talking to my therapist about it because <laughs> I actually have not made any time for myself. Mm. I used to, but right now I haven't. Um, and I think I'm going to blame it on the pandemic because in the past, even if I didn't make time for myself, I was forced to because there would be events or dinners that I had to go to after work that would kind of get me out and dress up and smile and have a drink and, you know, mingle. But now all I want to do is go home and get more work done or go home and rest so that I could wake up early and get more work done. So the pandemic in a way at the beginning was amazing, but then I got so used to that routine. Yeah. And so used to being alone and going home. Um, I really don't know how I'm ever going to get into a relationship again because I do not know how to be with anyone <laughs> else right now. But just like how easy it was for me to fall into that, it'll be easy for me to fall back into the other. It's uh, Everyone's like, how are we going to get back into the like natural flow of things? And literally, it'll take two days. Nothing did, ever. Did, did the pandemic interrupt a lot of your work or...? Did it kind of constrain the business in any kind of way or, or did you find the opposite happened? No, we're the busiest we've ever been. The only time it ever actually affected us was those real two months of lockdown where like it really was a lockdown. After that, it was like... So what's what's 2021 got in store for you? I don't... It's, it just hope to do more collaborations to grow my business as bigger as big as it possibly can. And honestly, I would love to have a project in London. So spread the word. Will do. I want a townhouse and um, I'm gonna say it so that it goes out into the universe. I want to design a townhouse in, um, what is it called? Kensington, Chelsea, Kensington. Belgravia. No, no, I want Kensington Gardens on Billionaire's Row. Oh, I know, okay. I want, I want to design a townhouse there, those white ones. Very nice. Talking about, and <clears throat> I would love a showroom in London to represent the Ryan Sagan collection. So just really branch out all over the world, become more international. Fantastic. Brilliant. Ryan, thank you so much for sharing for the behind me. the scenes there with how you work mm -hmm. and emotional awareness and how you, how you work with clients and congratulations on all of your success. And, you know, I've really enjoyed looking at all your work. It's just visually stunning, really, really beautiful, beautiful stuff. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It was good to see you. Bye. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.